Good morning and welcome to the middle of February. It's a bit uh, chilly and dark and rainy here and uh, uh, it's kind of crazy. But uh, anyway, I just thought I'd give you a little update on uh, some things that I've been doing in my life. Uh, everything ties together in my life. And uh, one of the things that happened uh, is for 30 years I traveled all over the country speaking in local churches and uh, spoke, you know, for many, many of those years, five nights a week and uh, loved it, enjoyed speaking, uh, loved traveling too, but maybe not quite that much. And uh, so uh, as uh, GCP matured, I slowed down a bit and haven't been traveling quite so much and kind of like it and uh, love being at home, love being with my family. But the one thing that I was missing was I just wasn't getting enough preaching time in. And for me, preaching is just super valuable and important and it really causes me to just to see Jesus and think spiritual thoughts. And honestly, I, I've said for ever since I started that I think Jesus made me uh, a minister to save me because <laughs> I, I needed to have my face stuck in the Word of God and, and uh, then think about it and have something to proclaim. So I love that. I mean, for me, preaching the gospel is the most invigorating, thrilling, cool thing that I ever get to do. So I uh, thought, you know, the traveling thing is exhausting, but you know what? I can preach right here in my living room. I can pull my camera out and I can start talking about the things of God and, and have the fun of that. And I can just put it up on YouTube. If somebody wants to watch it, they can watch it. If not, you know, at least I'm getting my own uh, spiritual experience. So I'm really been enjoying that. I've got quite a few videos up on uh, YouTube now. And there's a few people even watching them, so that's kind of fun. So um, I wanted to share with you a scripture this morning. This is the primary reason I connect with you once a month in this particular format, is uh, to share just some cool Jesus stuff from scripture. And I love the scripture. It always blows me away. But it's also very interesting how it seems as though uh, the Lord will allow us to interpret scripture in an extremely harsh uh, condemning way, or the scripture can almost always, the same scripture can almost always be interpreted in a very life giving and liberating way. So um, I thought I'd just share with you a scripture. This passage here, work it out, what it means to work out your salvation. Uh, this scripture has been a huge one in all of our lives. I think if you grew up in church at all, someone probably hit you in the head with this one at one time or another. You need to pray harder. You need to work more. You need to do more. You need to be better. You need to stop failing. You need to work it out, baby. Because, you know, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, that's not an easy thing. So it's interesting. This scripture to me tends to uh, be more used more in a chastising manner. But the interesting thing about the scripture is it's almost every single time taken completely out of context. So I'd like to look at the context of this passage this morning, <coughs> and I think you're going to enjoy it. So um, this scripture starts out First Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, which is one of the most significant biblical passages in all of scripture. The fancy term for this passage is called the kenosis, it, uh, which means the emptying. It's the Greek word for uh, to empty yourself. Jesus poured himself out. And uh, the idea here, well, we'll just, just read the scripture and we'll demonstrate the idea. So therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any um, uh, comfort from his love, if any, co if any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Now, first thing I want to point out is kind of the intangibility of the things that Paul is speaking to. He's saying, you've been encouraged uh, from being united with Christ. You've experienced comfort from his love. You've experienced a common sharing in the spirit. You've experienced tenderness and compassion. None of these things are quantifiable. <laughs> to use IRS language, you would say, these are the intangible religious benefits <laughs> of being a Christian. But... Um, but I find that this is interesting. This is the thing that Paul has said, hey, did you notice that? Did you feel that? Did you sense that? You know, our job as believers is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And my frequent statement is this, love is not an emotion, it's an action. 
but it's also not without emotion. And if you never have emotion, if you never experience encouragement, if you never have your mood elevated because of Jesus uh, and the comfort that comes from his love and the common sharing and this fellowship that we have in the spirit of God and that tenderness and that compassion, if that, if you never experience those things, we got a problem. But Paul says, hey, you have experienced that. And so let me just tell you a little bit about how it is that you get those things. Now, what those things are is actually gifts from God. There's something that God gives us when we believe in him. And uh, so the, the Greek word for gift is charisma. And so this is the gift that God gives us. He gives us uh, encouragement and comfort and the sense of common sharing in the spirit and tenderness and compassion. All of these good things, these come from grace. This is the process of God pouring himself into us. So what is grace? So in, in the Greek word grace, um, there's three uses of it. One is the word charisma, which means gift. And then there is the word charisa, which is the process of giving. And then there is you no know, charis, which is the process of giving. And then there is charisa, which is joy. So they're all three related. So back in ancient times, these kings would do something that was kind of similar to the American uh, native potlatch where they would give out gifts to their people, friends. And it was often a way of demonstrating their wealth and their prowess. And you were given the gift and expected nothing in return. At least that's the theory. Well, in these times, back in, in biblical times, the kings would do stuff like that. And they would give out this, this wealth. And it was to simply demonstrate how wealthy they were. So that was the idea then that came along of the unmerited gift. You didn't do anything to receive it. You didn't do anything to earn the favor of the king. This was more about the king than it was about you. So the king would give out these gifts and you experience this unmerited favor, but it was always tied to a gift. So charis is the process of giving the gift. Charisma is the gift. And charisa is the joy that you experience when you receive the gift. So I hope you forgive me for going so Greek on you here, but um, I feel like this is, it's part of understanding what grace is. So so in, in Christianity comes along and Paul really appropriates this term and, and says, this is Christianity. What is Christianity? Well, Christianity is when God so loved the world. And John, by the way, gives us probably our best, best definition of grace without ever using the term grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him wouldn't perish but would have everlasting life. So that is the perfect definition of grace. So grace is not just Christ's riches. It's actually Christ. So a lot of people will define grace with an acronym, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, which is nice, but it's not quite uh, the whole story, because it isn't just his riches, it's Christ himself. Now, of course, when you get Christ, you get his riches. But I think that's is a, a subtle but very important nuance here, that you're not just getting what he has, you're getting him, okay? And when Christ comes into you, you are transformed. You're made, you're manif you, you, you start to, you become a different person. Not because you try harder or do better or because you're just, you know, bucking up and being more disciplined, but because you've received a new spirit and his name is Jesus. It's not a spirit, it's the spirit of Christ. And so Christ comes into us, and when Jesus comes into us, we become a new, different, better quality person, as Corinthians says, a truly a new creation. When that new creation occurs, we're experiencing all of that goodness that comes, which tends to be the intangible religious benefits that we hear about in verse 1. Encouragement, comfort, common sharing in the spirit, and tenderness and compassion. So these things happen. So if you have experienced Christ, then Paul's basically saying, let me share with you how it is that Christ experienced his power on earth and let me share with you how it is that you can experience that same power so he's basically saying if you like what you've got but you want more of it here's how it works 
And so he then says, be, be like-minded. Like-minded with whom? You know, a lot of times people will use this uh, to uh, push people towards uh, some sort of a uh, doctrinal orthodoxy, uh, where we all agree in, in the same things about these doctrines. We all believe this, 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 and this. There's a few ones that we better get right. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is fully God, fully man. Jesus is the one way to the Father, and we're saved by grace through faith. But there's a lot of other doctrines that are not nearly so clear as that. And uh, so I would say, yeah, we need to be like-minded on that. But there's a lot of room on a lot of things. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that I remember uh, in, in growing up in uh, the movement that I grew up in, they were very into end times teaching. And... Um, this eschatological teaching, man, is like all over the map. I mean, they, you know, they're saying it's this way, and then 10 years later it's this way, and then another five years it's this way, and then, you know, and then in 1990 the Soviet Union collapses and all their theories went right out the window. So it's kind of interesting to me how much we push for orthodoxy in, in agreement in our doctrine, when really I think what this is scripture is saying is that we need to be like-minded not with each other, but with Christ. We need to have, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The, and so being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and of one mind. And that mind is not just each of us all joining together and agreeing together. It's us agreeing with Christ, having the same one mind of Christ. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value yourselves, value others above yourself. So there, he's describing Jesus here. This is what Jesus was like. He didn't do anything in selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is how Jesus did it. So, um, and, and then in relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So, so that's what he's talking about. Have the same mindset. So now he goes deeper into what that mindset was. In uh, verse 6, he says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So this is an interesting uh, statement. He did not consider equality with God, who being in very nature God. Okay, let me just go back to that three words uh, phrase there. Very nature God. Who being in very nature God. When it's saying that, it's saying this is who he is. He is the pure essence of God. Okay? But then notice this as he goes on down. And didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So he didn't hang on to that. The rights, the privileges, the powers, the everything that made, that is so different about God from that, from us. One of the people, one of the things that people often talk about, the holiness of God is that he is absolutely other than us. He's not just different in, in, by degree. He's different in kind. And uh, so he's very different from us. So, um, so, because he's very nature God. He didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or, or to be clung to. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Now, notice that phrasing, very nature God, very nature of a servant. Now, the very nature of a servant means that while he is God, he set that aside, and this is where you get to the kenosis. He emptied himself. He set aside all of his rights, privileges, powers, every single thing. That means he set aside omniscience. He set aside omnipresence. He set aside all of the infinite uh, nature of God, all of those attributes of God. He set them aside, and he became very nature a servant, being made in human likeness. Now, when it says human likeness, it's not a faux human, it's a real human. So much like a human that it was a human. He didn't just walk like a duck and quack like a duck. He was a duck. <laughs> Jesus became a man. Like the song used to say, what if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. He became truly a man. One of us. This is super 
important in this process of understanding this passage. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus comes and just gives his life. He gives his life and surrenders. Now, it wasn't suicide. He surrendered to, the, to this death on a cross. And, um, and there's some stuff that we need to understand about that process of surrendering. He became, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death on a cross. Now, let's look at that process of becoming obedient to death on a cross. It's the garden scene. Jesus is there, and Luke tells us he's sweating as though he has great drops of blood. Uh, we see him, him, him just super stressed out. So much so that three times he goes to his father in prayer and he says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. And then he prays it again. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He is experiencing a, an incredible trauma there in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's surrendering to the cross. And you know what? It's always difficult to surrender to the death that we're about to go through. And you know, the Christianity is about this. It's about death and resurrection. It's about Jesus coming and doing in us what we could not do in ourselves. That's called resurrection. You cannot raise yourself from the dead. But, and Jesus did not even raise himself from the dead. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And then it says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. So here's Jesus, and he is raised from the dead by the power of God. But how human did he get? Well, he got pretty stinking human. He says, I'm, he's stressed out. This is not... Uh, somebody acting like God Almighty. You know, if you're God Almighty and you know the future and the past and everything in between and you've got all everything all worked out, you'd be sitting there, you know, twiddling your thumbs in the garden of Gethsemane. Let's just get this thing rolling here. This is the motion I got to go through. But he's much, much more invested than that. And then we see him there on the cross. And what do we see him say? We say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I don't know that the father actually forsook him because we see shortly he's raised from the dead. Now, I understand that people say that God had to turn his back on Christ because God can't look on sin and stuff like that. I totally disagree with that, by the way. God's looking on sin every day of the week. And uh, uh, he, he is not intimidated by sin. He's much, much bigger. He's not a fragile little flower that's going to be destroyed because somebody sinned. Uh, he understands that sin is a big, much bigger problem for us than it is for him. I'm convinced of that. So, um, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. So, God comes and Jesus goes through this whole trauma there on the cross, dies, dead, stone cold dead, and then God comes in and pours his gift into Christ and raises him from the dead. Okay, so he, he therefore God exalted him above the high, to him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, restored all of the God stuff back to Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So here is this amazing thing: God raises Jesus from the dead, and uh, He raises him from the dead when He is in the middle of. He's just gone through this terrible, terrible thing. But this is how Christianity works. We are continually coming up against things that we don't have the strength to handle. And, uh, you know, pride is the belief that I can do it. Humility is coming to the honest conclusion, I can't pull it off. And we just surrender to the will of the Father. And we say, God, only you can do this now. Many of you on this team have gone through things like this in the last uh, year or years that I've been acquainted with you. Some of you have lost parents. You've had uh, extra incredible family relationship issues. Uh, some of you have been accused of terrible things. But you keep coming to Jesus and you just fall down in front of him. And, 
and and you're saying jesus i can't do this now here's what i want you to notice about this he then says therefore my dear friends as you have always obeyed not only in my presence but now much more in my absence continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling now this is a very interesting phrase work out your salvation with fear and trembling uh, the scripture says in first corinthians chapter 2 verse 3 i came to you this is paul speaking i came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling isn't that interesting i came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling but he came, didn't he? So let me ask you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 3. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Did he express faith? Yes, he absolutely expressed faith. But while expressing that faith, he experiences a lot of emotion. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's stressed out completely stressed out of his mind, sweating. He is tormented there in the Garden of Gethsemane. What is he experiencing? He's experiencing the same thing that Paul experienced, weakness, fear, and much trembling. Isn't that right? Not my will, your will. Not my will, your will. What's my will? Get out of Dodge. What's your will, Father? Surrender. Go all the way. Let me take you, let, let, uh, allow yourself to die so that I can come and do in you what you could not do in and of yourself. So Paul is using a, a speech pattern that he's acquired. It's a phrase that he uses, and we know he uses it because we see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. What do we see here? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Who wrote this? Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians 2, 3, Paul. So what are we seeing? We're seeing Paul describing a process of Christianity. What does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? It means exactly what Jesus did, surrendering to the Father and surrendering, taking the leap of faith is always a very freaky feeling incredibly scary you will experience every time you truly are expressing faith you will experience weakness and fear and much trembling some of you've heard me share that message on the canaanite woman she comes to jesus lord help me my daughter's suffering terribly from demon possession and jesus doesn't answer her word the disciples say send her away she keeps crying out after us she, this woman cannot be enjoying this moment. There is no way. It's pure racist rejection that she's experiencing. So then, uh, uh, the, then Jesus says, I came to the lost sheep of Israel, which sounds like, well, Israel, and she's a Canaanite. Now, I don't believe that that's what he meant exactly, but that's what she was picking up, and he wasn't really trying to clear up the picture that much. He would have used a few more words. If you ever write like that, we'll call you out on it, right? But here, here he, he says, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And she goes, uh, and then he says, it's not right. She, then she says, Lord, help me. How is she feeling here? Is she feeling like just all, oh, yeah, let's just do this thing. No, I don't think so. I think she's going, uh, I don't have any other options. I'm scared to death. The only one who can help me is about to reject me. He's in the process of rejecting me. And she just says, Lord, help me. And then Jesus says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Oh my goodness. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Jesus, what are you saying? And then she says, but Lord, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then he says, woman, you have great faith. And her daughter was healed from that very hour, set free from this horrible demonic possession. So here's an amazing thing going on here. This woman is expressing faith. She, but as she's going through this, she's experiencing the exact same emotions that Jesus was experiencing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Weakness, 
fear, and much trembling. She's experiencing the same emotions that Paul experienced in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, weakness, fear, and much trembling. And now she is doing what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 12, where he says, uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says this, for it is God. I love that picture. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So here's the father and he's saying, hey, I want to raise you from the dead, Jesus. I want to raise you from the dead. But in order to get raised from the dead, it has takes complete surrender. And the way we work out our salvation is not by trying harder. It's the exact opposite of that. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling uh, simply by coming to that place of brokenness and frailty where we realize, oh my goodness, I don't have what it takes to do what needs to be done to solve this problem. It's so far beyond me. Weakness, fear, and much trembling. But guess what? It's God who is at work in you. When you come to that place and you're in weakness and you're in fear and you're in trembling and you're just, you're doing the work of God. What did Jesus say the work of God is in 629? John 629, he says, the work of God is this, to believe. It's real work to believe in the one he has sent. But when you believe and you do the work and that work is not just hard work. It's not just sweaty work. It's scary work. Weakness, fear, and much trembling. You're doing that work. You're, you're believing in the Father. You're surrendering to His will. You're throwing your hands up to God and saying, apart from you, I can do nothing. And when you do that, you know what happens? He comes and He works in you. For it is God who is at work in you. And then you know what happens? You start receiving those intangible religious benefits again. <laughs> I love this. It, it, where it says, have any encouragement, you're going to get encouraged. Have, uh, from being united with Christ, do you experience the comfort from His love? Why do you need to be comforted? Well, frankly, you were traumatized as you were trusting Him. But you know what? He's going to raise you from the dead. And that is how Christ is manifest in us. When we come to that kenosis, that emptiness, that place where we realize, I can't do it, but Jesus does it in us. Wow, what an incredible moment that is. And then God comes and he raises us and he does in us what we could never do in ourselves. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I could have made it 15 years in this ministry if God hadn't been raising me from the dead. Because Nathan and I have certainly <laughs> experienced plenty of weakness and fear and trembling in this process. But I want to encourage you in this. Jesus wants to raise you from the dead. He raises us from the dead all the time. For we who are alive, are you alive? <laughs> are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that Christ's life might be revealed in our mortal bodies. So, hey, I love you, team. Uh, some good things going on in uh, in in GCP right now. Uh, we're uh, actually looking at changing some things up. Where we right now, when we send out books, just a little update here. Um, when we send out books, it's followed up by three postcards, and uh, we've been doing some research, and we figured out that we could actually do probably 60 Facebook ads for the cost of the three postcards. All kinds of ads. We could do pre-arrival ads where we're you know, waking up the people, hey, this book's coming, don't miss it. The book that's shaking up Griffin, Georgia. Uh, then we can also offer people the ability to send that book to other people. When a book is targeted, that really helps in its efficacy. And then uh, we can ask for response uh, from those people, uh, feedback, and then we can target anybody who responds to us and invite them to church and do a lot of things. So we're, we're really excited about this. Uh, we're gonna have to implement a new system. The nice thing is we won't have to print postcards anymore, which is quite a workout for the girls in the shop, but it will require other work, but it's more desk work and computer work than physical work. 
So we're excited about that. Be praying for us as we're seeking to implement this. We think that this could transform the awareness of what God's doing with these books. One of the challenges we face is people read a book, their life has changed, they pray, they ask Jesus Christ in their heart, they don't go to that church, they don't call a pastor, they don't call us, nobody knows it happened except Jesus. <laughs> that happens so much you can't even believe it. We're creating a response vehicle now where people can then respond through those Facebook ads, but also we've bought a URL. It's called iReadit.us. And uh, it's an awesome URL. And then we can put the name of a book, iReadit.us front slash detours. And we're going to put that URL at the end of every story. And we're going to say, hey, did you love this story? Tell us what you thought. And then they can easily type iReadit.us front slash detours into their computer, tell us what they want to tell us about the book. Uh, I think that's going to be powerful. It's going to give us a lot more of the feedback that these pastors really need to see, wow, this is effective. This is something I want to can do. This, this could completely change our organization and ministry. So we're pretty excited about that. Be praying for us that we execute this well. And not much for you to do that I'm aware of, but be praying for us. And uh, I love you, team. Thank you all, every one of you. I want to say a shout out to our beautiful friends, uh, Audrey and Becky, team members of the month. You're such champions. We love you. We're grateful for all you do. And have a wonderful day, team. Sorry this was so long, but I had a lot to say. See you later.